Thank you very much and thank you for the honour of uh, asking me to be at this wonderful conference and to facilitate this panel. I'm privileged to have uh, two distinguished practitioners from the Environmental Law Network on the panel with me to answer the hard questions about law, which I will deflect rapidly to them. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on and pointing out the bleeding obvious that it wasn't just their custom and practice but also their system of law that allowed them to live in balance with natural systems for tens of thousands of years. And I invite you to reflect on uh, how likely it is that our current system of law would have the same durability. Um, that being said, as uh, you were reminded, I have absolutely no legal education whatsoever. I everyone in this room knows more about the law than I am, so I'm speaking from a position of unassailable ignorance. Uh, <laughs> but setting out uh, an outsider's view of what I see as the challenges and opportunities in environmental law. Uh, the most fundamental point is that despite 50 years of awareness of environmental issues and 35 years of environmental law, still all the important indicators are worsening. Uh, so whatever the environmental law is doing, uh, it is only at best slowing down the rate of degradation of natural systems. Oh, that's interesting. Um, uh, Okay, obvious defects of the present system. Firstly, it's weighted to economic development. There's a presumption that any economic development that's commercially viable will go ahead unless uh, a determined individual or a poorly funded community group can show against the deep pockets of uh, large organisations and governments uh, that it is proven beyond any doubt, uh, even to the most purblind judge, that uh, the uh, consequence would be uh, tragic for the environment. Uh, secondly, it fails to consider cumulative impacts. It acts as if each proposal for a coal-fired power station, uh, for uh, a new development in a coastal area is uh, sui generis, that it should be considered on its own merits, regardless of whether it might obviously be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Thirdly, it deals very poorly with scientific evidence. The legal system is set up to work out in criminal jurisdictions who's telling the truth and who's lying. But in an environmental case, it's very rare for the experts uh, brought by the, uh, those wanting even the most outrageous development actually to be lying. What they are usually doing is giving a different defensible version of uh, the consequences for a complex system of going ahead. And uh, in a court of law, or indeed in a television studio, uh, a competent and honest scientist will always admit that there is uncertainty in a complex system. One who is less competent or less honest and who will give a clear black and white answer appears a more impressive witness. And so there's a real risk that junk science carries the day against an honest assessment of complexity. It rarely uses the precautionary principle which says where there is a risk of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty should not prevent action. Uh, there is in many cases uh, a clear risk of serious or irreversible damage to natural systems, uh, but uh, courts don't embody the precautionary principle. Interestingly, the New South Wales Land and Environment Court has now embodied that in the practice that if the opponents of a development can make a credible case that there is a risk of serious or irreversible damage, then the burden of proof shifts to the proponent to show that the risk is acceptable. And that seems to me a significant step forward. Uh, the system clearly can't handle problems like climate change, uh, and in a famous case in the Queensland court, uh, those proposing a new coal mine actually argued that since you can't identify any specific consequence of climate change, which is a risk of this development, separated from all of the other acts of burning fossil fuels, there is no credible legal case uh, for preventing. And on those grounds, uh, there is no credible legal case, if you believe that contorted logic, for doing anything to stop any release of uh, carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases. The system clearly privileges this generation over future generations and responds to short-term priorities. It makes no attempt to verify earlier studies or decisions and rarely enforces conditions imposed. And I remind you that uh, a law only has an effect if it is actually enforced. In the street in which I lived in Brisbane for 20 years, in theory, the speed limit was 50 kilometres an hour. Uh, 
uh, in practice because it wasn't enforced, the actual speed limit was about 100 kilometres an hour. Uh, we do not have any Commonwealth mechanism for enforcement of environmental decisions. The Commonwealth has uh, truth in advertising, an assessment and approvals branch because it assesses applications and approves them uh, and I think in three cases out of 5,000 uh, has uh, made qualifications uh, but it has no enforcement and I remind you that we don't have a competitive marketplace because of the Trade Practices Act. We have a competitive marketplace because the ACCC is prepared to enforce it and has a $50 million enforcement budget and is prepared to take even large international corporations to court to enforce the legislation. We have no mechanism at all for enforcing environmental legislation. And as you'd know if you've read Peter Burden's paper on wild law, the whole framework is underpinned by an anthropocentric framework which suggests that natural systems only exist to satisfy the short-term pleasures of the human species. And uh, just to uh, rub it in, uh, sometimes when we look like scoring, the Gold Coast get moved. Uh, in the case in which I mentioned, a particularly outrageous uh, decision by uh, a judge in Queensland was overturned by the appeals court on the grounds that it was transparently defective and the state government immediately passed legislation so that uh, they didn't need to go through the approvals process anyway. Uh, so um, we really have the feeling I think in environmental law that we're pushing the proverbial uphill with a pointed stick. So I'd suggest to you an approach to law reform uh, and since people like acronyms my appropriate acronym is stop crime. Uh, and that stands for, firstly, scientific panels informing the process. Uh, there is now a system in the New South Wales Environment Court in which if the scientific experts brought by the two cases disagree, they're required to attend a mediated conference and produce an agreed statement of what is known science, what is uncertain, and what is the scientific evidence for the two opposing viewpoints, so that the court uh, which one could presume won't be scientifically educated, will at least have a clear statement of what the science says and what the science cannot say. Secondly, I believe we should transfer the burden of proof so that those who are seeking to do serious damage to natural systems have to prove uh, that it's acceptable, rather than individuals or poorly funded community groups having to prove that it's unacceptable. And I think we should overhaul the standard of proof rather than basing it on the balance of probabilities which I don't think is acceptable if you're dealing with something like uh, irreversibly changing the global climate. Uh, is it acceptable to do it on the balance of probabilities? Uh, it's about 51% probable that this won't uh, irretrievably damage the global climate and destroy industrial civilization. Well, that's good enough for me, says the court. I think that those who are seeking to do significant environmental damage should have to prove beyond reasonable doubt uh, that their uh, course is acceptable. And we should have a system for evaluating past advice. Uh, and I made the point to a journalist in Western Australia recently that if I as were a financial advisor and I gave you bad financial advice which caused you to lose your savings, you would have grounds for a legal action against me. I think similarly, if an environmental expert gives advice in uh, a case and that causes damage to ecosystems or the loss of a species, they should be held accountable for that advice uh, and there should be legal redress. Cumulative impact should be explicitly considered because particularly in issues like climate change we really have the death of a thousand cuts where no one specific decision is damaging the climate but the cumulative impact is unacceptable. There should be real consideration of future generations rather than an assumption that what's good for those who are alive and in the courtroom today is good enough for us. There should be independent assessment rather than assessment produced by whatever hired gun the proponent can find that will give the answer they want. There should be monitoring in the light of claims and there should be enforcement of conditions. What's impeding this? Well, the fundamental problem, I believe, is that the legal system embodies community values. While we are anthropocentric and while we esteem economic growth above ecological integrity and social cohesion, so will the law.
So while I applaud people working to improve the environmental law and make the courts less prejudiced against the interests of other species and future generations, I believe we should also simultaneously be working to shape civilised values rather than hoping that legal palliatives might slow the impact of demonstrably inappropriate values. Paul Raskin, who heads the TELUS Institute, argues that the values that have driven society for the last hundred years are domination of nature, individualism and consumerism, and that these are now uh, directly antithetical to our wish for a sustainable future. If we wish to live sustainably, domination of nature, uh, the approach summarised by a colleague of mine in the phrase, white man speak with forklift truck, uh, the notion that <laughs> any problem can be solved by more technical horsepower, needs to be replaced by ecological sensitivity and awareness that natural systems have critical thresholds and limits which we transcend at our peril and a willingness to live within them. Consumerism, the idea that we'd be more fulfilled if we have a larger plasma screen and a bigger four-wheel drive than anyone else in the block, needs to be replaced by an emphasis on quality of life and an acceptance that enough is enough. Uh, and finally, individualism, the rather dotty notion that we can all be self-sufficient in a community of 6.7 billion people, needs to be replaced by what you could call human solidarity, an acceptance that the whole human family share these problems together. And uh, even bodies like the World Economic Forum now accept that these problems can only be solved by concerted global action. So despite all our efforts, natural values are still in decline. We could envisage a much better legal framework, but because the law embodies our values, we urgently need to be developing values that are compatible with a sustainable future. That's nothing less than our moral responsibility to other species and to future generations. I'll leave you with one image and a couple of aphorisms. The image is of the earth. It's the only home we have and the only home we'll ever have. There's no prospect of mass migration to another part of the cosmos or rescue by friendly aliens. We really should be behaving as if we intended to be permanent inhabitants rather than temporary visitors on a loot, rape and pillage mission. Uh, <laughs> I have a postcard at home that motivates me. It says in French with wonderful Gallic hubris, nous ferons changer le monde, we're going to change the world. And underneath it says in smaller writing, also in French, if it's not you, my little one, who will begin to change the world? Who will do it? It's a reminder that we shouldn't be waiting for other people. We should be doing whatever we can in whatever framework we can to advance the cause of the civilised values that would allow a sustainable future. Because what we do today, fundamentally, will determine the sort of world we live in tomorrow. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Simon Molesworth, whose CV reads like a, uh, uh, a history of environmental law in Australia. Um, he's a barrister and he's been a QC since 1995. He was the founder of the first Australian Environmental Law Association. He was the inaugural chair of the Victorian Environmental Defenders Office, the inaugural president of the National Environmental Law Association, a council of the National Trust of, uh, in Victoria for 25 years, 20 of those years as chair. He was a board member and then chair of the Australian Council of National Trusts and the foundation chair of the International National Trusts organisation that represented those views at, among other places, the Copenhagen conference. So Simon Molesworth has been fighting the good fight for environmental law for longer than most of us have been alive. Please welcome him to the podium. Thank you.